All right, there you go. Shall I start? You may. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for coming today. And Lillian, thank you for inviting me here today. I'm going to talk about a case study that I wrote up for the Georgia Genealogical Society quarterly. But first, you might be wondering why a white lady is up here talking about African-American genealogy. So let me address that. I'm a descendant of slave owners who started this research after discovering that. Um, and as you'll hear in a minute, my personal family story motivated me to start doing broader slavery research in Liberty County, Georgia, which led to this case study that I'm going to talk about today. Um, I did the case study for a personal purpose that I'll talk about in a minute, but also to il illustrate the benefits of a community focused approach to this kind of documentation. And I'll talk about that in a minute too. Today, I'm going to use it to describe my approach to working on the genealogy of a formerly enslaved person. And so if you have questions on a particular slide, feel free to stop me and ask. And then uh, other more general questions um, we can uh, deal with at the end. Let me try changing my slide here. So African-American genealogy research, of course, has uh, particular difficulties. In my view, um, that's led to a myth that it's difficult because the records don't exist. The truth though, as we all know, is that in a county that has abundant antebellum records like Liberty County, Georgia does where I do, I do my research, there are also abundant slavery records. Of course, the difficulty is that those records when they're indexed at all are indexed by the name of the slave owner and almost always the first name of the enslaved person only is in the record. So of course you can find yourself paging through thousands of pages of handwritten records looking for a ne needle in a haystack. Ancestry has a wonderful project to index all these records by all the names that are included in the record, including the enslaved people. But even so, it, it can be really difficult to decide that a particular mm -hmm. Abram, say, is the Abram you're looking for. One of the particular difficulties I've had, and I assume everyone else does too, is that it's also extremely easy to take the path of least resistance and assume that because the facts seem to fit, it must be that person. Um, also, since an enslaved person was generally only seen in the slave owner's records, finding them very much depends on whether the enslaver died, got married, went broke, et cetera. Otherwise, there might not be any records. With this case study, I'm going to work through the process that I use to try to find the records I need and to avoid the preconceptions that might lead me astray, which doesn't mean it doesn't happen, of course. Now, before I go on, I want to acknowledge not only the difficulty of African-American research, but the tragedy and the trauma that the records represent. Um, I'm describing a research process, and so I might sound detached from that during the presentation, but please don't think that I am. Trying to make these connections is very serious to me. So I'm going to touch on this briefly. Um, oops. Okay, you see my slide. I'm going to touch on this briefly because it really only helps someone researching Liberty County, Georgia. I have a pretty narrow focus. Uh, but one of the reasons it only took me a few days to research Abram Houston and come to a conclusion instead of the years that it could take is because I've created an online project called theyhadnames.net. Um, in it, a friend and I have abstracted or transcribed every antebellum will, estate inventory, deed record, and church record that we found for Liberty County that names enslaved or free, for that matter, African Americans. We've also transcribed more than 60 U.S. Southern Claims Commission petitions from Liberty County, and I've researched the petitioners for more than 40 of those. We've put together a list of divorces from 1865 to 1920, which is surprisingly helpful. And I'm working now on abstracting court records naming enslaved and free African-Americans from 1783 to 1865. The website has more than 37,000 names and it's fully searchable. So I'm not gonna talk any more about the website today, except that I'm always happy to talk to anyone who might be interested in starting a similar project. Um, it's really easy to set up actually. The They Had Names project came out of my discovery that my Liberty County Ashmore family were slaveholders. Ashmore's my maiden name. 
When I found my fourth great-grandfather's 1841 will naming 11 enslaved people, and I wondered if I could find out what names they took at emancipation and what happened to them. This table shows my conclusions so far, and you'll notice that Abram says unknown. So this case study was an attempt to determine if Abram Houston, a freed man who lived near some of the people held in slavery by my family, could have been that Abram that was in the will. So I'm gonna show the process I worked through to come to a conclusion. It was much faster for me because I had the advantage of the They Had Names database, but the process remains the same. By the way, you'll notice that on this list that of the 11 people my fourth great grandfather named in his will, only one took the surname Ashmore at emancipation. Based on my research in Liberty County, I'd say that only about 10% of the freed people there took their last enslaver's surname at emancipation. Uh, that complicates the research process, but I've also found that for many people, the surname they did choose points back to the early history of their family, which is always something to keep in mind. So the first thing I do is I start gathering information to build a hypothesis on who the slave owner might have been, since without that information, it's really time consuming and hard to look through those antebellum records. So I'm usually starting with the 1870 census. I've developed some tips for doing this research with the 1870 census. First, I, I try to correct the indexing when I find it uh, misdone on the 1920 and 1930 census in um, Ancestry because it's, it's really bad. Uh, I, I don't know who they hired to do it, but in those particular censuses, watch for misspellings, it's a problem. Um, I should say here that I normally do use Ancestry for building the family tree. Then I switch to Family Search for antebellum records. And I do that because my website is entirely free to use. So when I document records, I, I use Family Search because anybody can access it for free. So I've just gotten used to using it. Probably the most important tip here is if you haven't done much early African American genealogy, is to remember that after the Civil War, Families were very much in flux, and people often took in other people's children, usually relations. A friend of mine has said that the Southern African American community after the Civil War is the greatest example of community parenting in history. Um, since the 1870 census didn't specify relationships, we have to be very careful in making assumptions. It's, of course, very helpful if you can find the same family in the 1880 census, but even then the specified relationship may not be correct uh, depending on the informant. Um, as with all census records, you'll find widely divergent ages and name spellings between the censuses. And if the census record describes the person as mulatto, mixed race, it's a clue, but just take it with a grain of salt. I just heard a uh, podcast, Kenyatta, Conversations with Kenyatta Berry the other day, where she was talking with an expert in the census records. And he said that uh, the instructions for the enumerator to determine race was he was supposed to ask the neighbors what race the person presented as. And that's why sometimes you can get um, really wild differences between the census records. Of course, the 1890 census was lost in a fire. Um, I've had so many people just disappear on me between the 1880 and the 1900 censuses. Um, so these are just a few of the types of records that can help with documenting whether someone was still alive during this period. In Liberty County, the divorce records were in the superior court records. Um, my friend Kathy and I paged through them and constructed a list. Um, other superior court records actually give details like children and reasons for the divorce, um, even though, of course, they didn't have no fault divorce back then. Because the legal system was weaponized against African Americans after Reconstruction ended, unfortunately, the criminal court records um, for that time period can be very helpful for explaining absences too, and just for verifying that someone was still alive um, at a particular point. So we're looking for Abram Houston. I found him in the 1870 and 1880 uh, censuses with his family. As you would with any genealogical research, I noted that his wife's name seemed to have changed from Margaret to Chloe in that decade, and we'll get to that later. 
I saw that two of his children, Augustus and Abram, had either moved out or died during that decade. Of course, I can't actually be sure they were um, his or their children because of the lack of relationships in the 1870 census. Most importantly for right now, I noticed that three of his children, Augustus, Abram, and Georgia, were born before emancipation, and Nagar was born right about that time, so they could all be in antebellum records. I also recorded the names of his neighbors. I don't believe he had moved during this time period. Um, for example, even though the neighbors are different, uh, for example, I know that Toby Ashmore died in 1877 and, and his wife remarried and moved. The name of the one white neighbor, James D. Stevens, gave me a rough idea where they all lived just because of my previous uh, Liberty County research. I also checked the other common records for this place and time. I found that in 1879, Abram Houston married Mrs. Chloe Golding, so that explains the different wife's name in 1880. I'm assuming that Margaret, his first wife, died because I found no record of a divorce. Um, the 1870 and 1880 agricultural census records show that Abram Houston owned about 10 to 15 acres of land at that time. And the 1867 voters registration records showed that he was about 30 years old, or at least had lived in Liberty County for about 30 years old at that time. That's very much a matter of luck. The requirement was that the person uh, have been in the state for 12 months and in other county records I've found, they've just put 12 months for everyone, but Liberty County recorded the actual amount of time. The other thing I wanted to know is whether there were other people with the surname Houston living in Liberty County at that time. That's a judgment call. If his name were one that was common in Liberty County, like Quarterman or LeConte, for example, I probably wouldn't check because so many of the freed people from those plantations took that surname. But Houston is relatively uncommon in Liberty County, and there wasn't a major slave owner with that surname at Emancipation. So I did find three men, Booby, Pompey, and Caesar, and I looked for men because, of course, women's surnames were likely to be the same as their husband's surnames. I noted that they were roughly the same generation, so maybe brothers, and most importantly that Booby had a son, had named a son Abram, if you remember, Abram Houston had named a son Booby. So I added this all to my notes. I found Abram's son uh, Booby's 1938 death certificate. Of course, death certificates started being recorded in Georgia around 1919, and they're online at Family Search and Ancestry up through the 1940s. For Liberty County, at least, Family Search actually has the better collection. This didn't add a lot to my notes because I already knew that the family was living in the Midway slash Fleming area. I also did find tax digest records that indicated that Abram lived until at least 1890, but I didn't include them here. That was the end of the digitally indexed records where I could go into Ancestry or Family Search and put in the name and find them. So I then switched to records that have handwritten or typed indexes included in the digitization, but they're not digitally indexed, so you can't search them. In this case, we're, we're ta uh, talking about uh, Liberty County Superior Court records, which are online at Family Search and Ancestry. Um, I did find that John S. Andrews, who lived in the same area as Abram Houston, had sold him uh, 10 acres of land in 1872 for $250 which I am so curious about where he got $250 in 1872. I haven't solved that mystery yet, but I do know that this was part of the breakup of some of the plantations by the white owners who could no longer afford to pay the taxes now that their most valuable property, in quotes, the enslaved people who worked the land was gone. So Andrew's land was divided into lots and sold out. So that means it may or may not be significant that Mr. Houston bought his land from Andrew's since uh, it was being sold to a lot of different people. Also in the unindexed records, the ones you can't search digitally, I found a very useful piece of information. Abram Houston had married Mrs. Chloe Golding in 1879, which of course meant that she had been previously married. The records showed that she was the widow of Mac Golding and that they or he had had a son named John Golding. 
Chloe Golding had been the administrator on Matt Golding's estate until she married Houston when he took over that duty. And in fact, you can see in the signature for her that the clerk has erased Golding and substituted Houston. The probate judge, the ordinary, uh, who signed the document, Joseph Ashmore, was actually my second great grandfather. Uh, and the superior court clerk who recorded it was his eldest son. But there's a, another very significant piece of information in this record. It refers to a claim against the United States government. And I know what that was. The U.S. Southern Claims Commission was established by Congress in 1871 to adjudicate claims by loyal Southerners for property taken by U.S. troops for army use during the Civil War. Loyal meant loyal to the Union, and enslaved people were considered to have been loyal unless proven otherwise. White Southerners started with the opposite presumption. Liberty County had a large number of African-Americans who submitted claims, and Matt Golding happened to have been one of them. The claimants and their witnesses had to answer pretty detailed questions, and here you'll see that Matt Golding stated that Thomas Mallard had been his last enslaver. These records are absolute gold mines of information. I won't go into them further here, but you can find the transcripts of more than 60 of the Liberty County claims on uh, the They Had Names web website. And I've done a YouTube video um, about the Southern Claims Commission process in Liberty County. Ancestry also showed me a Freedmen's Bureau record for Booby Houston showing that after the Civil War, he signed an employment contract with John B. Mallard, Thomas Mallard's son. Thomas Mallard died in 1861. I took a class recently at the Georgia Genealogical Society's Institute for Genealogy and Historical Research, and the uh, class moderator, Dr. Debbie Abbott, commented that when she's re researching people, she wants them dead. Uh, of course, that's because there will be records. So I feel guilty being happy when someone died before 1865, but it means that there will be records. So now we see that people associated with Abram Houston were enslaved by Thomas Mallard. That's another piece of evidence. So let's summarize what we've learned so far. Abram Houston was born around 1833. He and Margaret Houston had a son born in 1855, earliest child that we know of, and they had at least three children born before the Civil War, which is really important for looking in the records. There were white Houston slave owners in Liberty County, but not at the time of emancipation. Abram married Chloe Golding, and her husband, Mac, had died just prior to that. Um, Margaret's children were with Abram and Chloe in the 1880 census, which is another reason I think that she had passed away. Um, Abram and Booby Houston both seem to have sons who were named for each other. Abram owned land he bought from the white planter John S. Andrews, and he lived near Toby Ashmore and Frank Williams, who I, I know were both enslaved by my ancestors. Chloe was listed as a widow in the 1900 census, so looks like um, Abram had, di had died by then. Moving on to antebellum records, now that we've put together all those clues from the postbellum records, I'm going to start with church records. In Liberty County and in many places like this, white and black people attended the same churches. In Liberty County, at least, this was mainly because the slave owners didn't want enslaved people gathering in groups without a white person present. However, in Liberty County, enslaved people didn't necessarily attend the same church their slave owner did or even belong to the same denomination. And I know that because um, there are records. Fortunately for researchers, the slave owner was normally listed in these church records and many of the records have survived. The most important record survival is the Midway Congregational Church, which is so shown in the picture on the left. Um, it was established in 1754, and the building you see in the picture was built in 1792 after the British burned the other one during the Revolutionary War. And this building still stands today right there on Highway 17. Um, it's pretty much untouched, except at one point um, they picked it up and moved it over about 40 feet when they widened um, Highway 17 there. The second floor contained the slave gallery. The records from 1754 until 1867 when it disbanded are online. And in fact, they were even typed up by a WPA worker in the 1930s. 
The church disbanded because the white people were moving away after the Civil War. And in 1867, a group of black members came to the selectmen and said they wanted to rent the church to form their own congregation. They did, and they had it for many years, and essentially they saved that church from falling to ruin. But they eventually moved up the road to the Midway First Presbyterian Church, which is the photo on the right. Um, the document in the upper right is the incorporation of that Midway First Presbyterian Church by a group of members, including Abram Houston. I typed up a spreadsheet of all the entries in the Midway Church records naming African Americans. Um, so it, a spreadsheet because then it can be sorted by the slave owner, the enslaved person, and the date. And it turns out there were more than 1,100 African American members of that church over its, its existence. Um, there's a book called The History and Published Records of the Midway Church. And you may not be surprised to know it only mentions three African American members. Uh, but it, it, it is a quite good book as far as the history of the Midway Church is concerned. Um, in a fair number of uh, the members, the African American members were named Abram. And in 1852, an Abram belonging to Thomas Mallard was admitted to the church. But of course, there were many other Abrams, so this is just a data point. Uh, there was a huge stroke of luck for researchers of Liberty County. There was a local pastor named Charles Colcock Jones. He conducted a census in 1846 of all the African-American church members in the 15th district, which was where most of the slave owners lived. Um, and he did it for all the churches in that area. Nine of the people that he enumerated were named Abram, including um, one named by John or owned by John Ashmore. We don't see anybody enslaved by Thomas Mallard on this list. The Abram enslaved by John Ashmore was listed as attending the Pleasant Grove Church, which is an offshoot of that Midway Congregational Church. And I happen to have those records from the early 1800s because John Ashmore was my ancestor was a, an elder there. And they show that um, the records include both the black and white members, and they show that Abram, belonging to John Ashmore, was both baptized and admitted into trial membership in the Pleasant Grove Church in 1830. So that's an important clue that led to my deciding that John Ashmore was not likely to have been Abram Houston's slave owner. So how did I come to that conclusion? Let's review why I thought it might have been John Ashmore, and then how did I rule him out? So why did I think it was him? There was an enslaved individual named Abram belonging to John Ashmore, baptized in that church. There was an Abram named in John Ashmore's 1841 will, and he was bequeathed to Sarah Ashmore Lane. Uh, he was mentioned in an 1859 document, um, a probate document. Also, Abram Houston had purchased land from John S. Andrews, and that land is mentioned in that probate document. In the 1870 census, Abram Houston lived near um, Toby Ashmore and Frank Williams, who I already knew to have been held in slavery by John Ashmore. So how did I rule him out? One simple thing. He was born around 1830. I have multiple records for that. If baptism on infants infants had been practiced at the Pleasant Grove Church. He theoretically could have been the Abram baptized in 1830, but they didn't do infant baptism. Um, so, and he was received on trial membership into the church in 1830, and they didn't do that with infants. So that little fact told me that Abram Houston was not the Abram that I was looking for. But I kept going, hoping to find some more information for his descendants. Um, so let's take a look at Thomas Mallard. In Thomas Mallard's 1861 estate inventory and division, we see four names in age order, Booby, Caesar, Abram, and Pompey. Uh, in this presentation, I've already discussed it or suggested some clues that might, that could lead us to consider that they might be related. But what happened in reality is that first I found this record and then I went back and looked at the other people named Houston in the 1870 and 1880 censuses. Of course, I should have done it the other way around, but I didn't. Uh, one tip I found is that even when an estate inventory does not list ages, 
People may often be listed in age order by family, and you might be able to determine that by finding a woman whose name is followed by people, and I'm sorry to put it this way, but whose value, assessed value, suggests they might be children, so they put a lower value on them. Um, and in their in descending order by value, so probably by age. So if you keep seeing that multiple times in the same inventory, a woman and then the people who might be her children in descending order, um, it's worth considering. You have to, of course, use other sources to confirm it, um, but it, it's a good clue. In this case, though, the ages make it obvious. I'm virtually certain that Tenna must be their mother, but I haven't been able to prove that. Um, also, there's a Margaret and a, um, a Nega following those names. Um, if you remember, Abram's, Abram Houston's wife in the 1870 census was listed as Margaret, and they had a son named Nega who would have been born around 1865. However, even if we consider that the 1870 census might have listed um, his name wrong, which is very possible, his age wrong, I should say, um, he would have been an infant at the time of this inventory, and he would not have been valued at $600. So some of that is just getting to know that kind of thing about the county you're researching. So what about Margaret then? Um, we know that Margaret and Abram Houston had three children who were born before emancipation, and they all could have been born by this time, um, given the vagaries of ages in the census records. This is where having a searchable database of all the antebellum records helped me. Because you could look through all the records for this, but all I had to do was just search for Margaret Augustus Abram Georgia on my website. And this record of Bartholomew Busby's 1863 estate inventory popped up. I, I believe this must be them. It was not at all uncommon in Liberty County for enslaved couples to be on different plantations, and normally the children would be with the wife. So this looks like it's them. Um, I just got lucky here because I have that searchable database. So um, one, this took me a few minutes instead of months to look through all the records. And two, Bartholomew Busby died in 1863. If he had died before the children were born and whoever inherited them hadn't died until after the Civil War, um, I wouldn't have been able, you know, there wouldn't have been an existing record. But this shows that information can exist. Can I pause you for one second? Certainly. Um. I just kind of want to reiterate the reason that she had said um, it's important to find people who died before 65 is in their will and estate records. That's where they would most likely list those enslaved by name and what happened to them. And so that's kind of the importance there and why you can find more information on those antebellum records. Is that correct? That's exactly right. And that's that's why, you know, you just hope they died <laughs> before 1865, because otherwise the timing can re be really bad for being able to find records. Thank you. So my conclusions were that um, Thomas Mallard was the slave owner of, wait, let me see if I might have gone. Nope. Okay, I'm sorry, I screwed up there. Let me go back to this last. Sorry. Oh, that's OK. Well, actually, we don't need the last slide for this. Um, my conclusions were that uh, Thomas Can Mallard. Go back to the slide view. Part, go back to the slide view. OK. Let's see. Sorry, that little thing is coming down. Uh, okay, can you see it now? And I'll go, sorry for the, uh... there you go. Do you see it? it? It went to your conclusion, but that's okay. Okay, wait, I am going to start this there from current slide. There you go. So my conclusions were that Thomas Mallard was the slave owner of Abram Houston and his probable brothers and that Bartholomew Busby was the enslaver of Margaret and her children with Abram. And we can see how it would have been really easy for me to go off track and conclude that Abram Houston had been held in slavery by John Ashmore, because that was what I wanted to find, just to be able to find what happened to Abram. 
But a closer look showed the truth, um, the apparent truth, I should say, since other records yet to be found might lead us down a different path. Um, I mentioned that I would talk about how I found the antebellum probate and deed records, since the records I found are in record sets that are not yet digitally indexed in Ancestry. I have noticed that the letters of administration uh, records for Liberty County are indexed now, so digitally indexed, so they might be getting closer. Um, I'm sure you all know that the record sets online contain handwritten or typed indexes that the courthouse staff made over the years. Um, I finally got tired of paging through the records all the time. So I took the results from Family Search and I made a linked finding aid for them. Um, so I'm gonna end this PowerPoint uh, presentation now and I'll switch over to my website quickly just to show how that works because it, it's been a huge time saver for me. And if anybody has any questions while I'm shifting over, that would be great. Let me get out of here. I'm gonna stop share. Okay. Let me share it again. Can you see that? It says Liberty County probate records? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's um, what I did basically is if you go in to family search and you search by the county and it'll pull up um, a whole record set of various kinds of probate records. Um, and there's just thousands and thousands of pages. So what I did is I took each record set and I put down in a, a file, uh, I put down the name of the record set and then they have these handwritten indexes or typewritten that are, it might be like 1200 pages. And so there might be an index on page 412 and on page 750. And so what I did is I went through and I looked for those indexes and then I linked to them. So now when I'm, trying to research something, all I have to do is, okay, I know I'm looking in for an account between 1845 and 1856, and I can click on the index, and that will lead me to the index online, and there it is, and it'll give me a page number, and then I can try to look for the page number. So does anybody have any questions about that or anything else? She's done a great deal of work yes. digitizing all of these and creating indexes for them. It, I, I hate to say it's kind of been selfish too because it does save me a lot of time as well. Would you mind showing a little bit more of your website? Oh no, not at all. Let me share the screen again. So this is... And if you'll uh, maximize your screen. Okay. Thank you. Is that good? Okay. So this is, it's just Liberty County, I'm afraid. Um, I've still got so much more to go with Liberty County. I haven't tried to branch out. Um, the contents of the site are basically abstracts and transcriptions of all the records we find. I just page through page by page and look for records naming African Americans before, mostly before the Civil War. And we uh, transcribe or abstract them. So we have pretty much all the wills, all the um, estate inventories, um, all the deed records. And there were um, bills of sale, mortgage records where they used people as collateral on mortgages marriage contracts where women were bringing enslaved people into their marriages, deeds of gift, um, have that sort sortable spreadsheet of the church. Um, there was a list of free persons of color because of course um, there was a certain period when free persons of color had to register uh, and you can find those registries various places. Um, the list of that 1846 church census um, now I'm working on the Superior Court um, antebellum records. There were records called uh, from Equity Court, and that meant that people who had inherited something and the heirs had a falling out, 
that they couldn't resolve via the law. They went to a judge uh, before a judge and they just talked it out. Um, and he made a decision based on equity, not necessarily the law. And of course, what did people argue um, a lot over? Enslaved people were the most valuable uh, property that they had. There's also postbellum orphan bonds and apprenticeships. And then um, I, we did a list of, as I said, it's mostly antebellum records, but we did a list of African-American marriages um, up through um, 1896, because without that 1890 census, it's just so easy not to be able to find people. And then again, the divorces of all races for the same, um, the same period. Um, little history of the Midway Church, because that was pretty central in Liberty County. And then more about the U.S. Southern Claims Commission files. And those, even if it's not your county, it's uh, interesting to read through those transcripts because they really give you a good idea of what the process was like. And I've found that it is really important what the process was like, um, not just the testimony that your ancestor might have given as a claimant or a witness, um, because the context really mattered as to how to interpret that. And then I've done some videos, presentations and things um, just to explain various aspects of the sites. Some finding aids. Um, this one, David Patterson's Guide to Georgia Slavery Records is really excellent. Um, it really helped me in understanding what kinds of records I was looking for. Uh, part of the, there's a database called enslaved.org um, that's a consortium of several universities and the Mellon Foundation. And I gave them a spreadsheet with all the people who were mentioned in the estate inventories. And so that's that's been published there. And then there are some stories too that have come out of the records. I found one case where a um, uh, Elizabeth Anderson, a young woman of color, legally married a white planter in 1818, which I, I've still not been able to figure that out. Apparently, that was not illegal in in uh, Georgia at that time. Um, uh, the story of a free woman of color, what happened to her. There was a different kind of uh, civil war story. Um, uh, a couple of young white men who didn't want to go fight. Um, and one of them went to an enslaved man on a nearby plantation and asked him to chop off his arm so he wouldn't have to go fight. Just to show that the story that's, the stories that are always told about um, uh, the Civil War, you know, there's a lot more uh, complexity in there. And then I found a really strange story of a white planter, Jacob Wood, who was actually the sheriff of Liberty County, and he moved to a nearby county and was a very prominent man there too. And he moved uh, to the Northeast, and when he died, he freed all of his enslaved people, it was 154 people, and uh, sent them to Liberia. Uh, I just was not expecting to find that. So that's on the front page. And then the documents, uh, just the various kinds of documents that you can browse or you can search. Um, different resources that I've put together. I've been trying to build a list of plantations as I see them, for example, list of names and alternate spellings. And then research that I've, and I started out not wanting to do research because I really just wanted to put the records online for people to be able to look themselves for their ancestors. But um, I've just found some threads that have been interesting and I followed them. And that's pretty much what there is. Which is amazing, once again. <laughs> I'm gonna stop share. So what's the website um, name or? It's uh, called theyhadnames.org. Mm -hmm. Or dot .net. Dot .net, excuse dot net. me. Okay. Um, and actually, um, I'm going to share our screen for one second. Um, let's see. So how long did it take for you to get to this point in terms of... Um, so what we what we did, or actually it was me who started it and my friend Kathy came in a while later, but uh, I didn't want to 
build a mass of data and then put it online because I don't know when people are going to be looking for it. So I wanted it to be available as people were looking. So I just started a free WordPress blog. And every time we did a record, I'd put it online. So I started that in about 2018. Uh, and so it's taken, my math is terrible, what, four, four years? years. <laughs> yes. <laughs> four, four years, four years. years to get to this point. Okay. Um, I was going to show real quick. Um, if you go to our library's website and just hover over Statesboro and go to genealogy, you can find links to her website as well as many others. Um, so we have, they had names right here. They had names. Oh, they had names. Yes, ma'am. So it, it's on the library's website, which these are all quick links to get to those. Okay. And um, Family Search, which she mentioned, is on here. Digital Library of Georgia, Georgia Archives, so forth, and, and local newspapers. Mm -hmm. So that's a quick way to get to the website. Lillian, you might want to add uh, glengen.com, which okay. is Amy Hedrick's website that focuses on coastal Georgia, not just Glen County. Okay. Um, but it's similar. Uh, the purpose isn't exactly the same, but she has a ton of information um, about the coastal Georgia counties. Okay. I will definitely be able to add that. Does anybody else have any questions? No. <laughs> oh, I, I think it's kind of, I'm still uh, curious, and even though I kind of understand, we were talking about, uh, what is it, mulatto versus, mm -hmm. you know, actually being a um, mixed, a mixed race, it's like, way back then, how were you going to really tell? I know. That's what I was really curious about. And so I was I was really interested when that man said that the census taker was supposed to ask the neighbors, because, in fact, um, Toby Ashmore, the only person I mentioned that took my family surname, he was listed as mulatto in the 1870 census. Oh. And I know that the enumerators knew everybody because I know who they were and they were part of the community. Mm -hmm. And I had actually I didn't I didn't mention this because this presentation wasn't about the website. But when I first started researching, I went looking for people on Ancestry who had Toby Ashmore in their tree and as an ancestor. And I contacted them. And so my fourth great grandfather uh, the DNA showed that he probably was Toby Ashmore's father. Um, so often it's correct, the um, the description of race, but it might not be too, depending on, yeah. And um, also remember that as the time changed, the interpretation, and, and I use that word yes. lightly, of race mm -hmm. changed. Yes, it did. Because we have seen people who they went from various census in um, 1900 listed as white, 1910 mulatto, mm -hmm. and 1920 they were listed as black. Yes. Because of the way yes. things were changing in mm -hmm. the nation and the way they perceived. So that's why it's very important to trace it going backwards. Oh, yes. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and, and it's not necessarily that anything within them changed, but the perceptions of that time period. So you have to be very careful and observant mm -hmm. of the historical era yes. that you're looking at. Mm -hmm. And apparently how they presented themselves to the neighbors, too. Yes. Could have changed. So the listing of mulatto, black, or white is not necessarily the skin color? Is it is Just the skin manner? color. It, it is the skin color in a sense, but um, say like the 1920s when Jim Crow was very active, they were much, much more prejudiced as to that kind of one drop rule. Yep. So if you had any African American, you were African American, you were considered black. They almost rarely listed mulatto at that time period. Whereas in the 1900s, it was more of a variety of listings. So that's where that um, historical perspective comes into play at that time. Do you have anything to kind of add to that? No, I don't think so. Um, I know uh, for an example, um, a great aunt of mine, they were 
they lived in Michigan and they were extremely light skinned. And when they visited family down in the South, her sister would have to actually lay in the floorboard of the car because she looked completely white. And it was, and, and this would have been back in the forties and things were just the way the historical perspective at that time period, it didn't allow the mingling, so to speak. But we all know it happened. It happened. It happened way more. And I'm glad you said did. that because even in my family, on my mom's side, oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I could stand some of my ancestors up, uh, my cousins even now, up against you, uh, Ms. Cole, and you say, who's who? Right. Uh, well, this, also, also, I'm sorry, but the DNA, um, I'm my DNA is 2% um, West African. So, mm -hmm. you know, the DNA shows um, that we're all a lot more mixed than yeah, we're mixed up. That's what I say. Mm -hmm. First time they brought the first slave mm -hmm. into this world, or onto, mm -hmm. the, you know, they call America. Right. Mm -hmm. That's when it all started. We had nothing to do with it, but right. reality right. tells us real truth. Yes. Sometimes people say, the older people, the truth is, baby, we all mixed up. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And, and the, the research I've been doing um, shows that it was just very common for these these um, white planters to have yes. yeah, children. And um, yeah, it was. It just and was. You have to I think. I would say a very good example. And we know we talk about history that's finally being, um, I say, brought forth a whole lot mm -hmm. more. Now, within my family now, I can tell all of you mom and dad and those aunties and uncles and older ones, they've always told us what was going on and how things happened when they were around or could have happened. But uh, a prime example is for years, we didn't know Abraham, was it Abraham, not Abraham Lincoln, but um, had the slave, what's the girl, young lady's name? Oh, Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson, That's mm. what I'm sorry about that. But for the longest time now that was, you know, things like that were kept secret, and I know right. why, we know why, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. my God, right. you know, uh, I think one thing that real has really played a big role for all of us is that DNA, I call it yes. Dana, yes. play, and it's like, now we really, yes. really know. Mm -hmm. Pandora's us. box has been yes. opened. <laughs> yes, okay, so no denying, oh, those are not my relatives, and mm -hmm. these are, and so forth, and Oh, no, no. Dana does not lie. That's the one thing none of us can get away from. Dana, Dana has it going on. <laughs> and, and one thing that's really been revealed, too, is I think a lot of people had that our family is Native American. Oh, yes. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> the, um, the woman, the free woman of color who married the white planter in Liberty County had to leave and go up north after um, he died. Um, she went with her children and she was listed as black in all the censuses, but her current day family, the story was passed down that she was a Native American princess um, <laughs> and, until they did the DNA and, and found out the truth, which they have embraced, um, but just interesting. Very, very. I'm surprised she lasted as long as she did. All her children married into the white community. Was, yeah, she lived for 10 years in Liberty County. She, they had four children together. I, I still, I can't figure it out. I had asked everybody I could think of, like at the Georgia Archives, to tell me if interracial marriage was legal at that time. And apparently it wasn't illegal. Um, was it? Illegal. I guess, it, I mean, it wasn't normally done, but yeah. it wasn't illegal. It, right. Yeah. So in other words, there wasn't like a precedent or... Um, a case right. it would have been illegal mm -hmm. but it was not common by any means right. yeah it wasn't written down as right say, yeah which I just assumed oh. it would have been but uh just uh just makes you realize history is a lot more complex yes. than at least I realized and and I personally love reading through case studies yes. and seeing things like this because that'll show you that when you're doing your own research, if you come across something that seems odd, mm -hmm. it doesn't necessarily mean that it's completely wrong. Right. So mm -hmm. 
more case studies and okay. seeing others results mm -hmm. helps you think of other places to look, mm -hmm. other scenarios that may have come into play and things like that. And so it, even if it's not pertaining to your family, it is so important to do research mm -hmm. on others as well to get a broad spectrum yeah. of research. Well, I thank you so much. And again, I commend you for your website. Oh, thank you. But yeah, thank you. Thank you all for coming. And Lillian, thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much. I'm going to go ahead and stop. Continue the success and we're going to get out our journeys a little bit more. Thank you.